Hello my bookish friends! Welcome or welcome back. I am Elizabeth. This is Reading Riley and today it's the video you've all been waiting for. It is the best books of the year! Yeah! I'm gonna delve into my top 10 books in order from number 10 all the way up to number one. I'm so excited about this. I don't typically like to rank these by number, but it's more fun that way. And so I forced myself, I forced myself to do it. These are not all books that came out this year. These are all books that I read this year, though a lot of them are new release books. There is a theme to my reading this year. There's definitely some honing in on what I like to read that is represented in this stack. I love just looking at this stack, this pile. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. If you like this stack too, hit the subscribe button. Let's be friends. We probably have similar taste. <laughs> that being said, I'm going to put all of my other social medias down here as well. And feel free to connect with me over there if you like. And let's get into the books. Starting at number 10, I have grown to really appreciate and respect this author this year, not only because she tells a good story, but because she goes there. And that is Miss Lucinda Berry. My number 10 book is The Perfect Child. If you're looking for a creepy child trope that is very much a thriller, has all kinds of crazy twists and turns, check this one out. We are following this couple, Christopher and Hannah. They both work in, a, in the same hospital. He's a surgeon. I believe she's a nurse and they have been trying to have a child for a long time and it's just not happened for them. When this little girl shows up, she has been so so abused. She is so emaciated that they think she's actually years younger than she really is. And Christopher kind of takes her under her wing. He does her surgeries, helps give her life again. They have an opportunity to parent this child. And so they do. But when that happens, the little girl doesn't so much get along with Hannah, not as well as she does with Christopher. And there are secrets about her that we don't know going in. I love the way this is told because the first chapter we get the perspective of the social worker who's on this little girl's case. And she has been interviewed by the police. Right off the bat, we know something went wrong. This did not go as was planned. And then we go back and we also get the perspectives of Hannah and Christopher. And from each of their stories, we see what actually unfolded along the way. And it's terrifying, terrifying. If you've ever woken up to a child standing over you, you will be terrified by this. It's great. I think this is my favorite of her books that I read, though Saving Noah is a close second. Oh, you can see my list. Don't look at my list. In the number nine spot, we have Fantastic Land by Mike Bakovin. I was kind of going back and forth as to whether I was going to put this on this list, but it's undeniable for me at this point. I had such a good time with this, not just the story, but the audiobook is fantastic, amazing, 100% recommend. This is kind of a take on the Lord of the Flies. In the story, there's a hurricane that has swept through Florida and left it in absolute devastation. It is a statewide emergency. They need help. But at this theme park that is kind of similar to Disney World, they have rations, they have supplies. And so they're very much lower down on the list of sending help. A lot of people were able to evacuate the theme park in time, but mostly the teenage employees are still there and they are stuck. They don't know for how long and they don't know when anyone's coming to help them. And they're just alone without cell service, without any communication to the outside world in this theme park. The way the story is told is through a series of interviews from a documentary crew who is coming through and interviewing these employees after the fact. Shit did not go well for them. Think Lord of the Flies. They ended up turning on each other. It was bad, right? But the cool thing about this is the way it's told, this interview style format, which is why the audiobook is so freaking good. Even though it's a little bit over the top at times, you have to put yourself in that situation where you don't know when you're getting out of here, you're desperate, you're scared, you have no communication. Put yourself in that headspace when you read this book. Otherwise, it's gonna feel a little over the top, which it is, but it's still fun. Each chapter is a new person's point of view. And so as we hear, we hear the first person's story and we say, oh my God, I can't believe that's how this went down. Then you hear the second 
second person's story and you say, wait a minute, that doesn't quite match with that first person's story. Then you hear the next person's story. And as you go through these interviews, you start to get an impression of what actually happened and you put the picture together yourself. And it's so phenomenal. I had such a great time with this. Number eight is We Need to Talk About Kevin by Lionel Shriver. You're gonna see a theme in here. And it is Creepy Kids. <laughs> that trope just works for me. I don't know what it is about it. Um, this one is kind of more literary but still has the twists of a thriller and it's written in epistolary form which I absolutely love through the perspective of Eva who is our main protagonist. We get to know Eva through a series of letters that she's writing to her husband after the fact. So she's telling you the story in retrospect about her son who committed a mass killing in a school. So very sensitive subject. Obviously, if this is triggering for you, do not read this because it gets deep into it. But the idea of this is that Eva never really wanted to have a kid. And so when she had Kevin, they never connected. This reminds me of the push, but kind of deeper and more psychological. There were warning signs, like there were warning signs. But the thing is, they don't know, we don't know, if because Eva did not want a child, did she somehow project that onto him, which made him behave this way? Or was he born this way? And that is why she never connected with him. And that's the kind of age old story of nature versus nurture. How did it get like this? But we follow Eva in the aftermath of this event. And we see her side of the story as well, where she is being completely shunned. She can't get a job. She can't walk around the neighborhood. People in the city where she lives, they hate her because she raised this child that did this horrific thing. There's a twist at the end that just blew my mind. Probably a bad way to say it for this type of book, but you get what I mean. I was shocked. I loved it. Amazing story. My number seven favorite book of the year is Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John and Dell. It's just a short little dystopian sci-fi book that I think everyone could enjoy. I want to say that. Maybe, maybe that's an exaggeration. But it's so well done, y'all. It's so well done. We're following several different characters across space and time. You start out in Canada in the early 1900s. There's another character who lives on the moon in the future and she is an author and she wrote a book and there's somebody in this book who she could not possibly have known about. And there is another man who is playing, I think, violin in this station this train station but it's not trains it's like a future vehicle or something there's one moment where it's like the sky opens up and he sees this forest and all of these people are connected in this really weird way there is a pandemic happening in one of these there's talk about time travel and all kinds of crazy stuff like there's really no good way to describe this book but it's so quick and it's so short at the beginning it starts off in the like 1900s perspective it feels a little bit old timey don't let that get you down because you will get into it after that it's it, for me it felt like oh oh am i gonna like this and then i kept reading and i was like yes yes i am in fact i finished it and then i immediately started it over and read it again it's one of those books that does that to you it messes with your head and it's so freaking good my number six favorite book of the year and we're continuing on with this trend it is the first day of spring by nancy tucker thank you to whoever recommended this to me this is another creepy child book but not quite all of these creepy child books are done just in subtly different ways this one i would say is not literary but not thriller but this does dive more into the psychology of it as well which we know i love we're following chrissy she's eight years old she just murdered a boy that's how the story starts she is eight years old she just murdered a boy so we have this timeline where we're following her throughout the action of things kind of like the big things that shaped her life how she responds to that how other people respond to that we're also following her however many years in the future current day where she also has a child of her own and she 
can't connect with her own child. She doesn't understand how to be a parent and she's trying. She's trying so hard, but as you learn how her past came to be her present, you kind of understand the inner workings of her mind a little bit more. This does play with the whole nature versus nurture aspect, but also it leaves room for a little bit of nuance that I think a lot of people might be uncomfortable with when it comes to like the psychology of a killer. Very interesting character study of Chrissy. Like in current day, her daughter falls off this wall and another mother rushes to help her and whispers something in her ear, probably to comfort her. But Chrissy is thinking, what did she say? I couldn't hear it and I can't, therefore I cannot mimic it. So how am I supposed to learn from this? She pretends to behave in a way that other people behave. She's good at it. She's good at mimicking other people but she just doesn't quite get it. So we're following her on her struggle as she tries to like understand her purpose in life and come to terms with the things that she has done and where it's led her to. And it's just really, really interesting and great, well executed read. Number five on my best of the year list is Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. I read this as an arc, loved it. And it's not my typical go-to kind of story. This is more of a mystery, but the atmosphere. Oh my God. The atmosphere. We're following the Darker family and Daisy in particular. They are gathering for Nana's 80th birthday at her like Victorian mansion on the cliff side of this island. Nana was told by a fortune teller that she was going to die on her 80th birthday. And this is her 80th birthday. It's her last hurrah. She's getting the family together. And then what do you know? Nana dies. From that point, every hour on the hour, someone else dies. We have to figure out who the killer is, why they are killing them, what are their secrets? They all have secrets. And it's just so much fun. The twist in this got me. I, I've heard other people say that the twist seemed obvious to them, but didn't when I read it at the time. It got me really good. I think for, for a lot of books, you have to be in the right place, the right headspace at the right time when you read it to get that full effect. And I just loved it so much. I loved the writing in this. The prose in here is a little bit more poetic than her typical books. And again, that's something that some people did not like, but I loved. I thought her metaphor and her simile was just beautiful in here. Not to mention we have all this awesome atmosphere from this old Victorian house with its nooks and crannies. And on top of that, there is like a Scrabble Thing in there as well which I love Scrabble so there's a little nod to Scrabble. Overall I just thought it was a great fun mystery with a perfect atmosphere, beautiful writing, and absolutely worth the read if you haven't gotten to it yet. This next one may be a surprise to some of you. It took me forever to read this book. I hadn't the, until this year read this book which is I'm ashamed of. I am very ashamed. I am ashamed. But I finally read it. Part of me just didn't want to even put it on this list because duh, like duh. It's of course going to be on this list, but I was late to the game. I knew the story going in because of the adaptation, but I still enjoyed this book more than the adaptation version. And that is Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. I'm so glad I finally read this. And I give the advice to you. If you've already watched the movie and you liked the movie, read the book. It's better than the movie. I still like the movie. I really like the movie of this, but the book always better so good. It's darker than the movie. The thoughts in their minds. Ooh. Um, and if you don't know what this is about, we're following Amazing Amy. She grew up wealthy in New York, I believe. Her family, I think her mom or her dad or both, they made this series of children's books called Amazing Amy, which are based on her and her life. She can never live up to the expectations of Amy. She meets Ben. Is his name Ben or is it just that Ben Affleck plays him. His name is Nick. In fact, his name is Nick Dunn. And <laughs> Amy disappears. And we follow the story to see what the hell happened to her. It's intense. You probably already know all about this. So good. So good. I had to put it on here. Gillian Flynn is one of my top three authors, for sure. I need her to write another book immediately. Please. I like honestly, please. Her writing's so beautiful. Her twists are so good. I, I love her. I love her. So Gone Girl, number four. It's there. Now for my top three books of the year. I'm so excited to share these with you. I'm sure you've heard me talk about them if you follow my channel, but if you're new, this is going to give you a good idea of the kind of books that I'm, I love and that I'm obsessed with. And the first one, number 
three on my list is A Certain Hunger by Chelsea G. Summers. You've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. You've heard of Ted Bundy. But have you heard of Dorothy Daniels? Hmm? Have you? Do you know the Muffin Man? Do you know Dorothy Daniels? If you don't, it's time you do. Okay? Dorothy Daniels, what is this about? What is this about? Dorothy Daniels is ahead of her time, perhaps, some might say. She is a woman telling her story, telling the story of her life, embracing her superiority as a woman. She tells us about her upbringing and how she came to be this famous food critic. She loves food. She loves extravagance. She is comfortable with her sexuality and she's comfortable confronting that and using it to her advantage. But one last thing. She's also a cannibal. She tells you the story about when she shoved an ice pick into her lover and then ate his body parts. But the way Dorothy tells her story is a satire of early foodieism. It is witty. It is hilarious. You cannot help but to fall in love with Dorothy despite that she is a terrible human being and a psychopath. This is the good for her story you have been wanting, you have been needing in your life. There's not a ton of twists and turns in here. There's maybe one little twist, but really this is just Dorothy telling her story, getting into the nitty gritty details. She's a badass. She is a freaking badass in the worst, most terrible way you can imagine. I loved this. I, I want to be friends with Dorothy, even though she's a terrible person. It's created a dichotomy of emotions within me that I can't understand or explain, but all I can do is tell you to read it to find out because this book is amazing. My number two book of the year. It's here. Okay, it's here. Number two is going to be Any Man by Amber Tamblyn. And I'm thinking a lot of you probably thought this was my number one. And it was damn close. But didn't quite make it. There's another one that just pulled in for the win. But that does not, that I cannot understate the significance of this find. This was one of those books that I did not see coming and it just bl it blew me away. It blew me away. It knocked me on my feet. It's so incredible and so amazing. This is written in a very distinct way. It has interesting kind of poetic prose, different kinds of media formatting. So keep an open mind to this. This is a discussion about how women are treated in the case of sexual assault. The way the point is driven home is by telling this as if we treated men the way that we treat women. So we're following, I think it's three different men who have been sexually assaulted by this female predator that is loose on the streets. She doesn't care who she's assaulting. Any man will do, hence the title. The way that these men react to this situation gives us such insight into how we treat women. This is not a good for her. Let's not confuse that. This, this one? good for her. This one, no, 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 no. It's disturbing. It's dark. And it's making a point. It's taking a political stance. And it's heavy. Okay. But this is one of those books that you finish reading and or that I finished reading and I felt like ready to take on the world, ready to fight back, kick some ass, defend the oppressed and change the world. <laughs> so if that's something you're looking to find, read this book. The prose is just so interesting. It's a mix of poetry and fiction. It really is unique and its own thing. This story just goes from horror to astonishing empathy and everything in between. And it's so all encompassing. It's so original and unique. I have never read a book like this in my life. I don't think I'll ever find another book like this in my life. I thought it was so fantastic. I think Amber Tamblyn is so multifaceted. She's not only an actor, but she is this brilliant writer on top of it. Like, wow, wow, how are you all? How is all of this talent in one person, in one human being? I don't know. Look up the trigger warnings if you're interested in this, because there are a lot, a lot of trigger warnings, probably for everything on this list. Look up trigger warnings. I probably should have said that earlier. I will always think about this book. Like, it's just one that sticks with you, and it's the perfect combination of horror with social commentary that makes you think and shocks the shit out of you. 
amazing book. Five stars. All right, and this is it. This is the moment. This is the moment that you've been waiting for. And it is my top book of the year. I I saw this coming. I, I saw it coming. I knew I was going to love this book. I love this author. This, again, another one of my top three authors of all time. I would say Gillian Flynn, Karen Slaughter, and Ian Reid. I love Ian Reid. I loved this book. I knew from the, the start that I was going to because of his other books that I've read. I admire him so much. I think he's so smart. But the way he writes horror is amazing. Okay, so in this book, we're following Penny. I think it's her name. Yeah. We're following Penny. She's an artist. Her partner passed away a while ago and she's now living by herself in her apartment and it's getting harder and harder to be able to take care of herself and take care of her own needs. She's surrounded by all these beautiful things that she has collected throughout her life. All of these things that are so rich in culture and so deep in meaning and she can't really appreciate them at this point in her life. She's eats bland soup by herself every night. She has trouble sleeping. She's just fighting with old age. And the landlord comes to her and says, hey, look, when your partner died, he had this plan for you. He set you up to be to go to this care center, to this facility to live in where you can be comfortable and taken care of. You know, she had a fall in her apartment and he says, you know what, it's time. So she goes there. But is this place what she thinks it's going to be? It's secluded in the middle of the woods. And she gets there and the first day, she starts to feel like the food she's eating tastes better again. It's like she's appreciating the things in life that come with having this appetite for life. It's coming back to her. She's being enriched by the people that are there with her. I think there's only five people that live there and then two people that work there. It's just this home. It's a house. Together, they have this kind of symbiotic relationship where they all bring something beautiful, either art or math or language or something. They all have their own specialty and together they are forming something that is beautiful and that's making them able to enjoy their lives again but then Penny starts losing time and we have to decide as the reader if her mind is just fading if this is the result of dementia or if there's something sinister going on in this in this house that we don't know about. This does have an ambiguous ending. So if you don't like that, if you're not a fan of like Paul Tremblay, then you probably wouldn't like this one. But if you like an ambiguous ending, if you like a book that's terrifying, that takes real life horror and turns it into a work of fiction, and if you like something that makes you think, and again, this is one that you turn the last page and you think, what the fuck did I just read? Like, what did I just read? And when I finished it, I just sat like I was in a coma for like three hours and just contemplated life. I went back and read the last chapter a few times. I looked up reviews. I was obsessed. And there he does this thing where he connects this possibly kind of paranormal sci-fi element to something that is real life. And that, I don't want to tell you any more than that because I don't want to spoil it, but so well done, so well executed and thought out. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Brilliant. I love it. Number one favorite book of the year. If you haven't read it yet, try it. it. I mean, this could be hit or miss. This could be one that's not for everybody. But for me, it's perfect. If you like Bunny, if you like the weird stuff, give it a shot. Why not? Number one. Number one of the year. Five stars. And those are my favorite books of the year. Ah, oh, it's, you know, we're, we're just like closing up the year, wrapping it up in this beautiful bow. And then we have a whole nother year ahead of us to read and discover and find new amazing books. And the prospect has me just, woo, excited. I love it. This is what we read for, for those books that we find that are life changing. Oh my God, it's snowing those books that we find that change us. And that's what we're constantly searching for. We're like book addicts. And for me, all 10 of these books did that for me, loved them. Please let me know in the comments below what was your favorite book this year or your for couple favorites if you can't narrow it down. 
especially if they're horror thriller or have some kind of feminist perspective, something that's super twisty, let me know. I always, always, always love getting book recommendations from you guys. And don't forget that life is short, so read Riley. Cheers and goodbye.